Anxiety appears to be a galloping epidemic. Since its introduction as a medical condition in the 1980s, anxiety has risen from about 2% of cases to being the most commonly diagnosed mental health condition. And today it affects more than a fifth of the population, including a third of all young people. And the COVID-19 pandemic, seeing millions of people in lockdown at home, sometimes without friends or family around them, is causing cases to soar. But while it is, of course, sad that so many individuals are struggling with feeling anxious, is the growth in anxiety simply a rational response to deeply uncertain times? Or is it an over-medicalization of behavior that once would have been seen as normal? Or is it a consequence of an obsessively distracted social media culture? And importantly, should we treat patients more or will we only address the crisis by changing our society and its toxic culture? Well, to discuss this, we have three very, very talented and qualified speakers. Caroline Hickman has worked in mental health and social work settings ever since she graduated in 1983. In 2018, Caroline joined the executive committee of the Climate Psychology Alliance, which aims to understand the mental roadblocks we face when trying to tackle the climate crisis. Then, former drug czar David Nutt is a leading authority on drugs, addiction and anxiety and has made the newspapers on multiple occasions for claims such as taking ecstasy is less dangerous than riding a horse and alcohol is more harmful than heroin. And Mark Salter is a consultant in adult psychiatry for the NHS. He's currently the media expert for the Royal College of Psychiatrists and is vocal about the need for a reform to the UK's approach to mental health. So three fantastically qualified speakers there and we're going to be addressing overall the topic of is the anxiety ep epidemic a rational response to modern times and to start that we are going to have three minutes from each of our speakers who will give us their thoughts on why precisely we should take their point of view. And I'm going to start for our first three minutes with Caroline Hickman. Thank you. So I'm going to be presenting a, a psychotherapeutic perspective on anxiety as a psychotherapist doing research with children and young people into how they feel about climate change and the biodiversity crisis and increasingly inevitably about the current virus and pandemic. So I'm going to be arguing that anxiety is part of life. It's the price we pay for being alive, awake and aware in the world. And we often, I think, emotionally have a choice between depression and anxiety. Depression, if we go inwards and don't go out into the world and take risks. As soon as we go out into the world and face the unknown and start to take risks, we will often start to feel anxiety. But one of the problems we've got with that is we treat it like it's an unwelcome guest. We want to get rid of it because it makes us feel really uncomfortable. So we don't want to listen to the message that the anxiety is bringing to us. So it goes away and sulks and then comes back again. So we can end up living our lives in a battle between trying to get rid of anxiety, trying to tolerate it, or just being overwhelmed by it. So I'm going to be arguing that actually we need to change our relationship with it and we need to listen to the messages that it's bringing. We need to listen to the wisdom and maybe there is a point to this anxiety because certainly at the moment there are things out there in the world, the origins of our anxiety, whether it's virus or climate change or biodiversity crisis, which should make us feel anxious because they are genuine threats. So do we want to fight them or run away from them or do we freeze or do we lie to ourselves about them? Or do we accept that these anxieties that are being provoked at the moment might make perfect sense? And actually what we should be doing is trying to listen to them and adjust in our relationship to them because that way we might be able to find a wise relationship with our anxiety. We might be able to develop more emotional, psychological resilience, which will help us to face the looming crisis when we're through the current pandemic of the climate and biodiversity crisis. And that's often what children and young people are communicating about when they're saying how anxious and afraid and angry they are, that we're not listening to the science, we're not taking action on the climate crisis. 
we worry about children and young people's anxieties, but actually we also need to be thinking about the fact that we're not taking action to reduce the cause of those anxieties by taking action on climate change. So what these children and young people are doing is they're somehow embodying our vulnerability. They're embodying for us the vulnerability that we might all be feeling at the moment as we move into this uncertain world. So I don't want us to defend against our feelings of anxiety. I don't want us to suppress them. I don't want us to get rid of them. I want us to listen to them and not disallow these feelings. Any of those things will just make it worse. And as I said, it'll come back. Our anxiety for me is a sign that we care and that we're alive and we're awake and we need to pay attention to that. It's a sign of empathy. Without uh, empathy and that compassion, both for ourselves and for others, particularly with these global crises that we're dealing with now, we would not be alive or awake or engaged as human beings. Caroline, thank you very much indeed for a very thoughtful and very concise uh, pitch to start us off with. Could I now turn for our next pitch to David Nutt? Thank you. So, um, as you heard, I'm a psychiatrist and uh, most of my professional career I have been uh, treating people with anxiety disorders. I set up a specialist clinic in Bristol many years ago. And one of the reasons I got interested in drugs and drug abuse is because I saw that uh, many of the drugs which people use to uh, deal with anxiety, like alcohol, can actually turn into problems of dependence. Uh, and that overlap between the psychological experience of anxiety and the pharmacological interactions that, uh, that people use to modulate it is uh, interesting for a number of levels. It's interesting because it uh, can produce problems. Uh, rarely does you solve the problem of alcohol by turning to something like alcohol. But it also raises fascinating questions of neuroscience, which is an area I have long been interested in. We can explore the brain mechanisms of anxiety by making inferences about the drugs which people use to deal with anxiety. And what is actually clear is that there is a brain substrate for anxiety, which uh, turns out to be both adaptive and maladaptive, uh, as, as you've heard already, that anxiety is necessary. If you're not anxious, you quite often wouldn't get up and go to work or turn up for your exams or your driving test or whatever. That is a motivating phenomenon. But it, there are times when it gets to a state when it exceeds motivation and it becomes destructive and, and damaging to people's function. Uh, and that's a maladaptive level of arousal. Uh, some people used to call it morbid anxiety. One of the most fascinating things is that for some people, they just, just can happen. You know, I have many examples of patients of mine who have just one day woken up with this overwhelming sense of dread. It was focused on nothing at all, other, and it seems very much a sort of internal kind of construct. So anxiety is a multifaceted phenomenon, and it's driven in part by uncertainty about the world, and in part it's uh, underpinned by biological changes in the body and the brain. And we have to look at all of those uh, to make sense of what's happening and also, of course, to work out how best to deal with it. David, thank you very much indeed. Very, very clearly put. And let me turn for the third pitch to Mark Salter. Thank you. I think there's something very revealing about the title of this debate. We talk about anxiety like it's a thing. In fact, like it's a kind of fungus that must be eradicated at all costs, a disease. And it's more than that. It's not a thing. It's a process. And another thing is the title, the, word's got the, word, the title's got the word rational in it. There's nothing really that rational about anxiety. In fact, it's important because anxiety switches off rationality. And that's a very important point. What anxiety is, is a process and it's a mechanism. And here's, I think, a killer point. It is common to every living thing on this planet. You can discern anxiety in the behavior of a bacteria, of a bee, of a, a tree even. And if the, I'm not joking about that. And what it does basically is it is a situation that's been conferred upon us by 1.4 billion years of life, i.e. evolution, to actually be on the constant lookout for things. We talk about fight or flight mechanisms. That's only a fraction of it. What really happens is that we are constantly monitoring one part of our brain, every single thing that is happening in us inside and around us outside. At the minute there's a discrepancy, there's an anomaly, a mechanism switches on that says, uh-oh, and you home in on it. Your body will evaluate it in a nanosecond far faster than a human thought could ever go. And if it's significant, it will divert all the resources of the human brain towards it. It will switch off every unwanted app, including rational thought, and it will make us take action. And it's not just flight or fight, it's freeze and it's faff. Now, 
this mechanism has served us pretty well for the 100,000 years that we've been on this planet, which is not very long. We had quite simple lives. We hunted, we gathered. It was sex and saber-toothed tigers for the most, most of it. But in the last 5,000 years, something bad has happened. I don't think it's that good at all. Okay, we had a bit of a near miss with rationalism with the Greeks and the Indians and the Chinese in the um, pre-Christian era. But around 500 years ago, a Frenchman said a very silly thing. He said, I think, therefore I am. Basically, he blew out the water, the idea that human beings are anything other than rational. So it was goodbye nature, goodbye human nature, goodbye kindness, goodbye emotion, hello algorithm, hello science, hello factories, hello pollution, hello greed, hello market forces. And as the years have gone by, what we've seen increasingly is our world getting busier and busier. We are poisoning ourselves to death. We are drinking the water. We are hogging the oxygen. We are robbing the common wealth of this planet. And that is becoming increasingly clear to us in many, many ways, this virus included. Meanwhile, that quietly ticking alarm clock in our body, that alarm system is detecting all this, and it is going off more and more because we're giving it more and more information. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.